go before the Lord in prayer. Father, tonight is your night. We're here. We've come into the house of God to hear from you. We approach the throne of grace. And Lord, in a time of need, we need your mercy. And we thank you, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of him, we can boldly approach the throne this night and make our petitions known. We would like you, Lord, to teach us the word of God tonight. We don't want to just hear it and walk out of here and say we feel good because we did some penance before you of going to church. How stupid is that, Lord? We want to be a people who have learning what your will, your way, your want, your desire, your plan for our lives while we're here on this earth. We want to know what it is. And we look to your word and we look to your teacher, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory and honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian and Charismatics and Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapel. And thank you, Father, for, if you will, Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and, and the way. And, the, and we thank you, God, for all the great churches out there, Ecclesia. And we thank you, God, that you're doing a great, mighty work in them because they're our brothers and sisters, and we love them. They're preaching the gospels, uh, gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, they are co-laborers with us, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God, we would ask that you bless them as you would bless us this night. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say... Amen. Oh, come on, give me a better shout than that. Amen. And now you're talking. Grace, you learned it last week. We've learned it for many years around here. Grace is a powerful understanding. Sometimes it's really misunderstood, and that's a shame, especially lately. But it comes around about every 20 years where there's a deep misunderstanding about the word grace, but let's don't go to the misunderstanding. You'll figure it out as you understand grace. You'll see it without a shadow of a doubt. Last week when we were here together, we found out that grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Now I'm going to say that again. I'm going to have them pop this up on the screen for you. Is I want you to think about what I'm saying because a long time ago when I was talking to God about the word grace, you know, I told God, I said, God, I, I want you to teach me about grace maybe some 20 some odd years ago. And I said, Lord, I, you know, I, I know some things about grace, what everybody says, like, for an example, unmerited favor. I think Pastor Dan mentioned this last week. And unmerited favor, I said, God doesn't really mean anything to me. I don't talk that way. I don't even know what unmerited really means. Un favor? I mean, how many times do we walk around and say, hey, did you find favor today? You know, we don't, we don't even talk that way. It's not even part of our vocabulary. And I said, Lord, I, I want to understand the depth of your grace. And I can't understand it all, but give me something so I clearly understand this, this, this word grace. And God just spoke right into my heart, and I, I'll never forget it because it was such uh, a luminous revelation, and it was God's sovereign divine ability. You could take that word ability up there, and you could put it in parentheses and write the word power in there if you wanted, because it's the same thing. God's ability translates into God's power. I need God's power. I need God's power to navigate through every day. I need God's power to, to get through life and make the right decisions. I need his ability more than I need my own ability. But God's sovereign, I love the word sovereign, and that means God can do whatever he wants to do. It's not restricted to very much. It's just his sovereign move. It means it's God reigning over everything. He's a preeminent God to everything. God's sovereign divine ability that does something. It gets a job done, listen to this, 
on my behalf when I can't do it, when you can't do it. You know, you can go just so far with your ability. You can go just so far with your education. You can go just so far with your talent and your gifting. You can go so, so far with your education. And then you run out, and you're going to finally realize that whatever's ahead of you that you need to accomplish, you can't accomplish it. And it's the grace of God that's going to come in. His power, His ability, that sovereign move of God that's going to hook up with your effort. And when He does, then it's your effort and His effort makes the job done and it's called grace. In every facet of our life, this church wasn't built because someone was smart. You know, everybody tells me all the time, oh, Pastor, you did, you did such a great job. You did such a great job. Can I tell you something? The, I'll be really honest with you. You know what I did? I just followed God. I was too stupid to do anything else but follow God. If you want to know something, some of the stupidest people in the world become the greatest followers of God. Because it's all we have is His grace to come along and help us in a time of need. And that's why the Word of God makes it very clear for all of us. You know, very seldom do you see a man of God or a teacher of the Bible, uh, especially if they have degrees and, and uh, all kinds of educational backgrounds, ever really admit to you that truth. The truth is, without Christ, we have nothing and we are nothing. And that's really the truth. And as great as Paul was as a, a writer of the New Testament, two-thirds of the New Testament, he said these words, everything I have and everything I'll ever do and everything I'll ever be is because of God's grace. God's grace working in his life, making something happen. Let me tell you something. What I just said to you, that your future is absolutely boundless. You can, cannot even imagine the depth that God has for you in the future. If you learn to trust God's grace at every turn of the road, Get out of the way oftentimes. Be a follower. Don't try to be the leader. God is the leader. We're followers of him. And when you follow him, you can't do anything but be successful. Come on, somebody. All of us together, I want you to say the words out loud. Say, God's sovereign, God's sovereign. divine ability, divine ability. To, get the job done. to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills. You don't know how you're going to get the job. You don't know how you're going to buy the house. You don't know how you're going to get the car. You don't know how you're going to pay off that situation. You don't know how you're going to get out of debt. You don't know how your marriage is going to work. You don't know how anything's going to work. Let me tell you something. Everything you're wondering about is wrapped up in that word right there, and it's called God's grace. Most people don't go to the grace of God. They go to the solution to a problem mentally, and that voids out, you'll see later on, in the power of God. See, here's this great thing about grace, and there's four things I want to share with you this night about grace that are just simple things, but one of the greatest things is this, things to know about grace. Just pop that up on there. Write it down, number one. And I love this. Grace is a free gift. Yeah. Well, let me just say this to you. Grace is a free gift. Free gift is a funny word. Because if I earn something, then it's not a gift. If I work for it, it's not a gift. If I have to put resources towards it of any kind, then it's not a gift. Grace is a gift. And don't stop there, because I could give you a gift of a billion dollars, and you would shout and holler and up and puff, scream and yell, and do a Pentecostal jig right here in front. <laughs> and can I just say something to you about that? If you don't know how to access it, you don't know how to use it, you don't know where it's at, you don't know what bank it's stuck in, and you don't know how to get it out and use it, the gift doesn't do you one bit of good. And here's this gift been given to us by God. Oftentimes, it's not applied in your marriage, your home, your trust. Now, your confidence is not put in a gift. It's put in some formula solution instead of in the very character of God's grace. And that's what we're talking about tonight. 
talking about this free gift that you didn't pay for that God gives to you. And he gives you not only the free gift, but he also shows you how to access the gift and where it's at and how it works. And did you know the funny thing about the American church? Most people don't understand the word grace because they've been stuck in these words, unmerited favor. My goodness, yes, it is unmerited favor. But it's a whole lot more than just unmerited, unearned, if you will, favor. It really applies to every area of your life, and it's part of your life. It's a gift that God gave you, your family, your home, children, finances. It's a gift God gave you to change your future and bring a purpose and a destiny in your life. I want to read to you, if I may, this Romans, the fifth chapter, and verse 15. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 15, says this. But the free gift is not like the offense. For it, by the one man's offense, many died. That was obviously Adam. One man's offense, many died. You didn't do anything, but you're part of that. And grace is different, because you're part of grace, and you didn't do anything. But the difference here, much more, the grace of God and the gift of the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And all of a sudden we see that this gift is for many people. We gift is free for all of us. And it's not for destruction, but for blessings. It's for prosperity in every area of your life. When I mention the word prosperity, I'm not just talking about money in your pocket, even though I'm not excluding that. I'm talking about prosperity as great marriages that work, that are happy, that you're happier 50 years after you've been married, more than, than when you first got married. Yeah. You're more in love in a marriage 50 years after you've been married than you were the day you got married. Yeah. You see, I'm talking about children being raised in the ways of God and protected and ministered to. I'm talking about families growing up and serving the Lord. That's real prosperity. I'm talking about Bosses that work and are appreciated that can think with the mind of Christ and do things that change the world that they're in every day. I'm talking about changing your entire family structure and realizing that there's a destiny and a purpose in your life all because of grace. Grace is not just about one little thing. It's about whatever you're facing that you have need of. God loves you so much. He wants to meet that need. And it abounds towards us to many. As the scripture says in Titus, the second chapter, verse 11, it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, this is what surprises me, to all men. Wait a minute. You see the words, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to how many men? Wait a minute, how many men? All. The whole world, the grace of God is there for them to take advantage of. The free gift of God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on their behalf is theirs. But it doesn't do them any good because they have no acknowledgement on how to activate it. Yeah. And they don't activate it. But it's for all men. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't pay the Christ price just for you and I paid the price for everybody that will accept him. Isn't that a great thing that he did that? He wasn't selective. I like you. I like you. I don't like you. I do like you. He said for all men if you'll just simply activate the grace that's been given to you for salvation it's for you but you're going to have to realize it's out there but you're going to have to take it. See a lot of times people don't realize that grace is not something you just get well, you do. It's true. No doubt about it. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. You do get it. But also, it's a grace that you move in. You understand and you apply. You recognize. It's not just sit back and get it. And it works for you without any conditions on your part. The Bible actually says, and we'll get into this later on, that you can actually frustrate or even cause the grace of God to be void. Oh my good. How about this? Uh, uneffectual. Ineffectual. You can cause that by not understanding this grace that's this free gift. 
Second thing I want to share with you tonight about grace is grace freely justifies us. When I use the word justify, you need to know what I'm talking about. It really means that the high courts of heaven and the superior, preeminent judge of everything, God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, when he looks at you, your past and your life, he raises a gavel in the high courts of heaven and slams it down and says, innocent. Not because of anything that you did, but because you activated the grace that was given to you as a gift. People oftentimes say, you don't have to do anything to get the grace of God. I know you don't. You got it. But if you don't know how to access it, use it, and understand it, and not violate the principles of it, it's not going to work for you. So you do have a part to play, don't you? Obviously. You didn't have a part of Calvary. He fulfilled it all at Calvary. Jesus did everything that was needed for salvation at Calvary. But did you know that I had to at least get involved in it by receiving the work, the act of that cross at Calvary and the resurrection? I had to do my part, which was to receive it, or it would not do me one bit of good. Because he went to the cross for everybody. And grace is for all people. And yet it doesn't do any good unless you understand the principal part that you must play for grace. A lot of times we don't want that. We just want to think, well, I don't have to do anything. Well, you don't to get it. But if you want to put it to work, you're going to have to do some things that are pretty smart. And God is not stupid. Does anybody listen? So here's this high court of heaven. Here's the creator of the heavens and the earth. Here's the ultimate high judge. And his gavel goes down over you, and he says, innocent, justified, price paid. And you go, whoa, what did I do? You accepted him. You believed in him. You live your life towards him and for him. It's not works, it's just the way it works. Sometimes we think that, well, that would be works. No, but if I didn't accept him, I wouldn't be saved, would I? I mean, is that not true? If I didn't accept him and I turned from him all the time, would I still be saved? I don't think so, hello? Am I in this room alone? Guess what, you wouldn't be saved. So there's a part you have to play. And the high courts of heaven have set you free. Romans, the third chapter. And let's just start with verse 23 of Romans in the third chapter. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. How did I get in that? For all have sinned. I didn't do anything wrong. You were born a human. And from the bloodline of Adam and Eve, you're now here. And in that bloodline, there was sin. You could have been the sweetest, nicest person upon the planet. But guess what? In the blood said, said these words, we have all sinned. And, and, and listen to this, fall short of the goodness of God. Man, that's a big statement, isn't it? But I like the next statement better. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Man, that's good news. I want to accept that in my life. I believe that in my life. I want to bring that into my life. I want to live my life by that. I want to live that life that says I am justified. I am been proven innocent. My past and my shame and my filth and my sin is gone because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and all because of his grace. But I want to receive that. I want to take that in, man. That's, that's good news right there. So it's free. And this grace has also been something that brought the gavel down on your behalf. Not only is it free, but set you and pronounced free. 
Number three of what things you ought to know about grace. Grace doesn't come by my effort. And I should write this underneath this. But my effort can stop the grace. Let me say it again. Grace doesn't come by my effort, but if you're making notes, write this in parentheses underneath that. But my effort could stop the grace. So important for us to see these words because grace doesn't come by my effort, but my effort could stop the grace. So it's important for us to live our lives according to what he outlines. Verse, if you will, the fifth, of, fifth verse of the 11th chapter of Romans says this, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. At this very present time, there's a remnant. According to the election of grace. Do you know who that is? It's you. You're the remnant upon this planet that received and takes in the grace of God. And in verse number six, it says it like this. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. And you want to understand not to mix this up because there's people that try to teach you that you don't have to do anything with grace. And in a sense, that's true. It's a free gift. But they mix up what we do for something that we're trying to achieve that we already have. We have salvation. It's a free gift to God, from God, by his grace. But my efforts backs up what I believe. And he's not saying here that works voids out grace. He's just letting you know that by grace is there not because of works, but doesn't say don't work. Follow me? And that's why James comes along. And by the way, those people that teach you don't have to do anything and leave it at that, say the book of James is no longer a viable Bible book in the Bible and should be taken out of the Bible. And I want to just ask you a question. Doesn't your Bible say he that extracts or takes away or adds to the Bible? Oh my goodness, a curse do you be. So you can't just look at a book and say it doesn't fit, so let's make James fit. Here's what James says. Listen to this. Go ahead and pop up James in the 17th verse of the second chapter. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Not talking about grace. He's talking about faith, understanding what grace is. So here we're talking about something. And he makes a statement. Faith by itself without some action, some corresponding responsibility is not grace at all. I mean, not faith at all. And then he goes on in verse number 18. Let's read it to you because it's really fascinating. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So there are people out there that are saying, listen, I don't have to do anything. That's what he just said in that verse. But here comes the writer makes this statement. I will show you my faith by what I do, what I accomplish, what I feel like, I'm motivated by. Can I just say this to you? Go back to grace, it's a free gift, but if I don't take grace in and apply it in my life and understand in my life, it's not gonna do me any good, I'll show you that in just a moment. 
Now he makes this statement. He says, I'm going to operate by faith, but faith doesn't really operate just by itself. There are people out there that say you don't have to do anything, but I'll show you my faith by what I do. Because of what I believe in and what I act like in accordance to what I believe in says a lot about what I really believe in. Is that not true? In other words, if I really believe something, then I'm going to act like it. I say to Debbie, I, Debbie, I really love you, man. I am do- not man, but really love you, honey. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> I really love you, honey. And can I just say this to you? And I don't co- act like it? Then what am I saying? Words are cheap. Let's get down to some action here. And he, verse number 19 makes this statement, says, you believe that there is one God and you do well. So now he's starting to ridicule the person who says, I don't have to do anything from, with my faith. He says, you know, you believe there's one God, you do well. But then he stops, he says, even the demons believe and tremble. It's true. So now he's made a statement to who? The person who has faith but doesn't put any works behind it. That's who he's making the statement to. Verse number 20 comes along and he says, do you want to know, oh foolish man? Do you want to know, oh foolish? Do you want to know, oh foolish man? Now he's calling him a fool. And he says, don't you want to know that faith without works? I didn't say that, my friends. It's written in the Bible. In other words, if I believe something, then I got to put some action behind it. There's a responsibility for what I believe. If I believe I love my wife, then I'm gonna act like I love my wife. If I don't really love my wife, it's cheap words and I never act like it. Verse number 21 comes along. Was not Abraham our father? Oh, this is interesting. Justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? The answer to that is absolutely. The answer to that is absolutely, because in those days, their actions showed what it was that they really believed. And verse 22 comes along and says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? In other words, he had such faith in God that he could offer up his son Isaac. In other words, when God said, take your son to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice, your only begotten son, the one you love so much, he didn't hesitate at all. He said, God, I love you so much, I believe you. He didn't stay back. He got on his donkey, got his men, went up there and started offering him. And in the midst of offering his son up as a burnt offering, God stops him and says, I don't accept burnt offerings. But now I know that you have a heart for me. His, his actions proved his faith. Is that cool? And he says this, watch these words. He says, you see the, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Now you believe something, you're going to have to do something. It's just really that simple. You know, God's full of grace gives us lots of time and effort and energy to grow to maturity to be able to do some of the things that God is requiring of us. He's not putting pressure on any of us because that's grace to help us to get there. And it's really powerful when he says this. In verse, if you will, in verse number 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, to watch this. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith. Thank God he put the word only in there. Only. It's not about that. It's not about just, it's not just being justified, but it also has an a action part behind it. It's the same exact thing with, with grace. Grace is a free gift God gives you, but there's a responsibility if you really believe this to do something about it. Then if you don't do anything about it, grace still works to get you in heaven. Nobody said that. But wouldn't it be silly to live your life not doing anything when you could have done a lot for God? Come on, somebody. (laughs) 
It's a powerful understanding of what things are taking place. Grace, if I could just write this on the overhead for you, grace doesn't void out our responsibilities. Grace may be, re- number four, I love this one. Now we've, we've covered a lot tonight, this is the last one. Grace may be rendered ineffectual. And it's rendered ineffectual by oftentimes our actions. So here's this free gift that we could have. We don't do anything about it. Therefore, the gift is never applied or never operated. Now watch this. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses one and two says this. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God not to receive the grace of God, not to receive the grace of God, not to receive the grace of God in, what's that next word? Vain. Vain. What's it? Vain. One more time, what is it? Vain. Vain means it has no possibility of rendering benefit. In other words, it becomes null and void. And he says, I'm begging you This grace that has been given to you, don't treat it as if it's not important and understand it. Because if you do, I should have highlighted the words, grace of God in vain. I don't know if you guys could do that in back, or at least the word vain. I don't know if you could do that right now. Because here he comes along and he says, we plead, we beg. You know, when the Holy Spirit writes something through somebody else, here's the Holy Spirit begging you and I something. And he says, I plead with you not to receive. In other words, don't take it in and do nothing with it. Make it of null and void. Because who receives the grace of God but the whole world? It's a gift to the whole world. And how many of you know do something with that grace? Because the next verse, verse number two, is really powerful. And he said, in an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now watch this. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words, here's this grace that God says, I will cover everything. I will bless you and open up doors. My power be at your access. My, my, uh, my uh, strength is yours. My ability becomes yours to use. But don't take that and make it null and void because you haven't accepted the acceptable time. Today, some of you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be serious about it. If you don't, then the grace that was offered you of his power to help you in life, to get you through, has now become void because you shunned it. And you turned it away, and you thought little of it, and you didn't take it in. If this grace is given to you, if I was giving you a billion dollars, you'd take it in so fast, you would, you would do everything you could to get it. You'd take everything you can to get it, you'd run up here. If I had gold bars up here, 50 pound gold bars, and said I'm giving them away free tonight, if you'll come up and get them. There isn't one of you that wouldn't get out of your seat and come and get it. And what I'm offering you is a whole lot more than 50 pounds of gold. I'm offering you the power and the ability of God. Because that verse, that last verse, pop it up again, if you will, verse two, if you will, it says this. He says, behold, in other words, look and see, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Some of you are in here and you haven't given God all of your heart and you haven't given God all of your life. That's what you need to do to get saved, to activate the grace that you need to live your life down the road. 
And you're sitting back wondering what's going on. I don't know if I want to give up my life. Your life stinks and you're going to get to the end of the road where you realize it has nothing whatsoever to do to offer. Why do you think these rock stars that have fortune and fame, more money than they know what to do with, kill themselves with overdose? Because they don't have anything in life to set their life on. They have no goal, they have no purpose, they have no plan. There's no destiny for them and God gives all of that by his grace. Why would you not want to receive the grace of God to Tonight. So here we are in this safe and friendly place. Here we are. And why not tonight you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and start calling on the grace of God, realizing you've been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why not give him all of your heart? Why not give him all of your life? Why not be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell? This is the day. This is the acceptable time of salvation. And all across this auditorium, right now, I'm going to pray a prayer for you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And if you want me to include you in that prayer, I'm going to ask you in a minute to raise your hand Bow your heads and close your eyes, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, say, include me in it on that prayer. I want to see your hand go up, because it's your acceptable time for Jesus Christ. It's your day of salvation. God brought you here. Hold on. We'll do it all at once. Hands are already going up all over this place. Tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here for a purpose. Don't miss the grace, the ability, the power, the strength that you need to live that prosperous life that God has set before you because you took the grace and you shunned it and you didn't receive it. Tonight you can receive his grace. It's free. Go ahead and put your hands down right now. Go ahead because all across this auditorium there's hands going up. I want you to think about it. Some of you need to get right with God And you think you're a Christian, but you can't think your way into heaven. Nowhere does the Bible say you can be a positive thinker and you get to go to heaven. Some of you think you're a Christian because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven and have eternal life because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. Maybe they took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class as a child, put a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father. And Jesus who went to the cross and paid the price for your eternal salvation, let me, let me say this to you, is ready tonight to give you the grace of God, his power, his strength, and a future. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's bow our heads, no looking around. I'm gonna give you a moment of privacy with God. You know who you are, you know where you're at. You know that those words are about you, that tonight is the acceptable hour of your salvation. And tonight you need to make a step and give God. And you wanna be included in that prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you know it, so stop trying to talk yourself out of it. And you know you need to do this. Because grace, his grace is waiting for you. And it's a free gift. But you have to activate it by receiving it. You can't sit back and do nothing. It's a very small group of people that say, a remnant that say, today I'm part of the kingdom of God. You don't want to go to hell, you want to go to heaven. You don't want to stay lukewarm all the rest of your days, you want to be a fired up Christian for Jesus. Belong to him in the family of God. I am going to pray for you. Jesus says there's only one way and he's the way. He tells us what it is in John, the third chapter. He says these words, you must be born again. That means you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. He gave you all of his heart. And truly he gave you all of his life, didn't he? Come on, didn't he? Yep. 
then you can give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. It's that simple exchange. Take his grace tonight. Or sit there and make it void in your life by doing nothing. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Be born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna go like this. One, two, three, and I'll sound like this. Bang, I'll pop my hands together. When you hear that sound, bang, that means it's time to raise your hand. Let me see it and put it right back down. Why do I have to see it? Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'll see your hand go up, you put it right back down, that simple. But let me see it first, and then you put it right back down. And when you hear my hands pop together, bang, you get ready to put your hand up. Who should put their hand up? If you've been running from God instead of to God. You know who you are, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. Get ready to give him all of your heart and all of your life. If you've never given him all of your heart, tonight is your night. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, tonight is your night. Get ready to give him all of your heart and life. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. My goodness, you're saying, I wonder if I've really given God all of my heart and all of my life. I, I'm not sure there's any grace at all in my life. Well, why not make sure? It doesn't hurt you one bit to make that step and make sure that you are. If you wanna be included in that prayer, get ready to put your hand up also. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, I'm talking to you, there's no one looking around, every eye is closed. It's your private time, it's your call. Couldn't get simpler than this. I'm gonna to count to three, pop my hands together. Everybody that wants to be included in that prayer of salvation, here's what you have to do, is get your hand up and let me see it. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you, seven, eight, thank you. Back over here, let's keep them up. There's nine, there's 10, thank you. Back over on this side. There's 11, 12, 13, thank you. There's 14, 15, 60, thank you. Back over here, thank you. In the family room, there's 17, thank you. How many, just one in the family room? Three, 17, 18, 19, if there's 19, don't you know there's 20? Go ahead and put your hands down if I've already seen your hands. Wherever you are, t number 20, you're somebody that kept your hand down but you know you should have raised your hand. Now, I'm calling you because God's already spoken that to you. Where are you, 20? There you are, thank you, God bless you, number 20. Is there 21 in this place tonight? This is your acceptable time. I can't make you do it. You gotta wanna do it. That's giving God all of your heart, be born again, headed for heaven, denying your, is there 22 in here? Is there 22 in here? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, praise God, lift your heads up, open your eyes and give the Lord a great big praise for 22 people that'll receive the grace of God tonight. Isn't that cool? All right, everybody, here's what I want you to do. All 22 of you that raise your hands, I'm gonna pray with you right here. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend, back in the family room. If your children raise your hand, bring your children. This is the time you bring your children up here. If you're in this place and you're alone, Fine, just come. If you're sitting with somebody, say, come on, I'll go with you. If you need to, I'll go with you. Don't let anybody not come. If you raise your hand and if Jesus can walk the streets, a beaten bloody mess for you while people spit on him and called him names so that he could take your sins from you, you could walk a safe church aisle. And get up here and let me pray with you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Wait a minute, if you didn't raise your hand but you know you should have, you can come too, you just come. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I surrender all. Come on, come on, come on. I surrender Oh, they're coming, give them a hand as they come. If you raise your hand, come on. Oh, they're coming. Come on, you come too. Give them a hand, they're coming. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come 
God now. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand. Come on. You're serious about God. Get up here. Come on. There's still more of you that need to come that you raised your hands. There's a bunch of you, probably 10 more of you. I can't make you come. Here's some more coming. Thank God. Let's give them a hand. Listen closely. You don't get saved because you raise your hand. You get saved because you give them all of your heart and all of your life. Sometimes you just need to walk down a safe aisle. Because stop and think about it. If you can't walk down a safe aisle at a church, how will you ever live for him outside of these walls in this dirty, rotten world we live in? You will never make it. If you raise your hand and you're serious about God, I'm gonna have him sing this song one more time. You need to come. We're praying for you to come. You just come. We love you enough not to leave you out there. We love you enough not to let you be silly in your relationship with God. But if you raise your hand, get out of your seat and get up here. Appreciate that. Let's give them a hand. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Is that okay? If you miss a word or two, don't worry about that because God reads the heart, not the words we speak. But try to say the words out loud. I'll go slow. That's all you have to do is say, Lord, follow what I say, okay? So everybody bow your heads, close your eyes, and the whole congregation is going to join in with you. Everybody say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. I believe you sent him for me. I believe he died for me. I believe his blood washes away my sins. I repent from my evil lifestyle. And I turn my heart to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known in heaven as well as on this earth. I am born again. Alive Alive. forevermore. Forevermore. I'm saved, saved. justified, Justified. going to heaven, heaven. receiving the grace of God. God. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. I'm alive Alive. forevermore. Forevermore. Give the Lord a great big praise. Okay, cool. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. See this guy right over here? He's going to give you some free stuff. Only takes a moment. He's going to tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll explain what that is. Let you come right back into your church, into church service so you can go. People who came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Because well, no embarrassing things go on. No weird stuff goes on. No goofy stuff goes on. He's just going to hand you some free stuff. Is that okay? And tell you about a program that we have. Let you come right back to church service. Go ahead. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there.